My name is Mike Butcher. I'm a journalist. Oh, well, in fact, I'm more than a journalist. I'm actually one of the editors of TechCrunch. Who's heard of TechCrunch? Anyone? Just a few? Yes, please. Thank you very much. Um, you're probably in the wrong conference if you haven't heard of TechCrunch. <laughs> um, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here in Berlin. Uh, again, what an amazing town for tech and for developers and for engineering. Um, so it's my pleasure today to interview uh, Eric Stillman, who's a CEO and uh, you are the co-founder, aren't you? Yeah. Co-founder of Rapid. How do you say it? Rapid? Rapid? Rapid, yeah. Rapid. Very easy. Um, um, Eric, you've, um, you started Rapid in uh, 2016. You built an e-wallet product to allow consumers to withdraw cash from an ATM. But nice. it's just really been the beginning of a journey, hasn't it? Because it's a very e-commerce e friendly payment startup. You've, do you've done the gamut. You've done absolutely um, just about anything you can think of to do with payments, which is really interesting. Probably in 2016, people didn't think that that was possible. What sort of barriers did you face back then? So back then, you know, we started a company that was supposed to be a consumer uh, facing e-wallet product. Uh, without understanding what does it mean to build, you know, a consumer facing uh, financial services application. In 2016 and 17, when we were original days of the company, we stumbled into every single barrier that existed from the fact that we needed to get regulated, opening specific type of bank accounts, which are called custodian bank accounts, building systems for sanction screening and transaction monitoring and fraud prevention and a wallet ledger. So we had to build this huge stack, infra infrastructure stack, you know, to support a very simple need that we thought it is managing like a consumer facing wallet product. And you know, back then when we were building it, people told us that we were crazy that we we're trying to build something like this. Um, what, but the, you've, so you're doing a range of financial products in payments, mobile wallets, money transferred, card issuing, fraud protection. Um, and, but the key to it is this sort of API approach uh, for, for a third parties to integrate it. Um, quickly, um, what's why did you take that approach in the first place? So, so the original approach was different, right? We tried to build this consumer-facing product that required us, by definition, to build a lot of different things across the board. So if you're trying to build the consumer-facing e-wallet product like a PayPal or something like this, you find yourself, you know, in a requirement to be able to manage a wallet with multi currencies. You have to KYC. Based on, based on regulatory requirements, you have to know your customer when you open a wallet or a bank account. You have to some, uh, somehow allow people to deposit money into the wallet, withdraw money from the wallet, and make payments from the wallet. Now, when you build this, you actually understand that you're building five things that anybody on planet Earth needs, regardless of what you're trying to build in financial services, which is collecting money, disbursing money, storing funds in custody, doing foreign exchange or issuing a card in order to spend the money that sits in the wallet. So when we discovered that basically we build this infrastructure that includes all these capabilities, we understood that it would be much smarter from our perspective to switch it from a consumer facing wallet to an API because everybody needs it. It doesn't matter who you are at the end of the day, you either need all five services or one or two out of the services that we build. And this is when we took the approach of an API because we understood that what took us 18 months to build in one market, which was the United Kingdom, you can actually build on top of this platform in a matter of three days, two weeks maximum, uh, in much global scale with an API. And I actually, what, just at this point, I forgot to mention at the outset, uh, everyone, is that in your Swap Card app, if you have comments, questions, you can actually go to your the session here in Swap Card and have a little live chat about the discussion. You can also ask us questions, etc., which some of which I might be able to read out if you have any points. So check out your Swap Card uh, application while we're chatting and ask some questions, and we'll bring those up. But um, one thing I want to ask you, Eric, is. Basically, when you're building this stuff, you have to go to banks, you have to go to payment processors. What what sort of level of integration are we talking about? Did you have to literally go and like help them build some of the infrastructure themselves? In some cases, yes. So th these are the, the hardest situations, right? In most of the cases, what we've done back in the days, in the early stage of the company between 2016 and 2019, was basically take all this mess that exists from a technological perspective 
with the banks, with other payment providers and et cetera, and try to build a modern stack on top of it that hides all the complexity and all the dirt that exists behind the scenes. In some cases, in some you know specific countries, we had to convince a local bank or a local partner to basically build stuff for us because there was literally nothing there. But the key for the success was to try and build something that streamlines for the developer his work. So he doesn't need to really think what is the difference between doing a transaction in Germany versus Mexico versus Indonesia. Everything should look the same and he's just executing on code. And that was the, the heavy lifting at the end of the day, streamlining all these different uh, countries and their requirements and expose it in a very easy way to use. Where do you think global payment infrastructure is sort of heading at the moment? Um, uh, there's a lot of talk about something called embedded finance, for instance. But what does yeah. that mean from a from the perspective of the audience here? So, so the way that we also present it internally uh, to the company and also to the developer, to the uh, shareholders and to engineers, is basically the fintech infrastructure play is at the current stage in the same place where cloud computing was in 2010, right? If you look at it and you go back in time to the beginning of 2000s, of beginning of cloud computing, cloud computing was, this is a server, I will take it and I will put it in somebody else's data center and he will manage it for me. Fast forward, you know, 20 years later, cloud computing became this endless infrastructure that includes servers, networking, file systems, queues, databases. You have all these different things in the cloud. And I think that, fintech and financial services infrastructure is basically what uh, cloud computing was 10 years ago. And if you fast forward it 10 years from now, basically anybody that would want to build anything in financial services in a 10 year time frame from now will just plug into a platform that will give him all these capabilities without thinking about, okay, what do I need to do? Which country I want to operate? Where does it sit? What are the requirements? It's basically going to be a plug and play thing. So, um, you, you know, what sort of product scaling is? You've got two things I think is interesting is in, from perspective of what you guys are doing is you've got to scale the product, but you've also got to scale the team at the same time. Yeah. What, um, what sort of approaches have you taken? So, first of all, just to explain what does it mean to scale the team from a numbers perspective, right? Uh, January 2019, I think we were like 80 people. And in January 2023, we were 900 people, right? So that's that, that's the scale that you're talking about. You're talking about basically in a three-year time frame, 10x, you know, the team. I think the biggest challenge, you know, of scaling the team uh, to the size is, first of all, how do you recruit? Because when you're a small company below 150 employees, you have a lot of influence as a CEO or as a management team with the recruitment. And then you start losing control above 150 people because you're not involved in every single person that comes in through the door. Uh, and the second stage, how do you train people? Like training and learning and knowledge transfer is a key element, you know, when you scale a company. And I think what we learned over time is that we have to build a significant internal team to do training and, and learning and knowledge transfer. We have to provide much better documentation for anything that we do because people come, people go, the team grows and people need to understand what the hell is going on inside the company. It's not that simple. Uh, and, you know, providing some kind of a better explanation to mid-level management, what exactly is the DNA that we're looking for, for employees to keep pretty much the company around the same type of culture that we wanted it to be in the beginning. It, it was super challenging. And by the way, even today, it is very challenging after we build a world-class training program that can train people that come in that have no clue about fintech or payments. You know, we can train them all the way to being an expert and explaining everything. And the documentation comes in in a very good level. It's still very hard to keep the team in the same level that you wanted it to be when you started the company, you know, uh, six, yeah. seven years ago. Yeah, it's quite, yeah, it's a, a huge issue culturally, isn't it? But you've also, to, in order to do this, you, I gather you've built this sort of rapid developer community um, to make it sort of a, quite a developer-centric company. What, what, what does that shape does that take? So because I was reading that you have a community of 50,000 people, this is on Discord or something. Yeah. So what's, What's the incentive for them to get involved so in some way? Let, let's start with the fact, why did we do it, right? Yeah. So if sure. you look at traditional companies in fintech or payment space, 
you typically sell to the finance department or to the product management team. What we discovered over the last uh, three years is that a lot of times the actual buyer or the person that is highly involved in the process of selecting a specific uh, platform is an engineer that has a lot of influence of what the company is going to do. Uh, and we decided to basically become much closer to the engineering community. We've done it in different ways. First of all, we started what is called the Rapid Developer Community, which is an online community for engineers that can get involved you know, in the product, provide feedback, ask questions. We had a series of hackathons that we ran over the last two years uh, for a variety of you know, challenges uh, that we even sent uh, the, the winners of the hackathons to space last year. Uh, we This year, we did even a more radical shift we change the company into what does what does a comp what does somebody win if they get in the, if they're involved in a hang hackathon so in every single hackathon we have different types of prices you know one time their price was a Porsche an electric Porsche, Porsche. yeah there, there, there are some serious prices right they vary based on the, the type of the hackathon but the hackathons are very much uh, luxurious let's call it this way from a pricing pr structure perspective I think the biggest move that we've done, you know, in order to get closer to, to developers was this year when we actually split the company into business units. So we have business units that are actually P&L or revenue related, like collect, disburse and issuing. But we also have a business unit that is called DevRel, Developer Relations. And the only focus of the business unit is basically building out anything that is related to the developer experience in the company, you know, from a better sandbox environment, better API documentation, better SDKs, a lot of involvement around the community, the hackathons. So it's like we curved out from the company a business unit that solely is, the, is focused on, you know, managing the relationships with the engineering teams. So, um, what, uh, so um, you've done, I mean, uh, does it, it, the hackathons and the events and things, do they happen all around the world or what, what, yeah, yeah. online so, or what? The, so most of, like, most of the time they're online. It's every quarter there is a hackathon online. And once a year we do a physical event, which is live. Last year it was Lisbon. This year we didn't plan yet which, uh, which city it will be. And basically every hackathon has its own theme. And, you know, you can sign up and you can find it either through the community uh, or through the Rapid website. And you also have a partnership program. Is that the same as the developer program or is it different? So the developer program is, is actually not a commercial program. It's more, you know, for building a, some kind of a bridge to educate engineers and to get feedback back from engineers about what they're looking for. The partner program that also engineers are involved in is actually a revenue generator. So some of the engineers are actually building applications or websites on behalf of others. There might be a dev shop or some kind of another arrangement or outsourcing. And basically, we allow them to get revenue share and actually generate money out of the applications or websites that they build for their clients if they're part of the partner program. I see. So there's there's a whole sort of range of things going on there. But um, you've also developed... Um, you know, a big relationship with small and medium-sized businesses. Like, so you've got small and medium-sized businesses using it. How many so far using Rapid? Uh, so we have a client base, 215,000 total clients worldwide. Out of them, 210,000 probably are SMBs. And is it easy for them to, to integrate it in some way? Uh, yes. Yeah, so we have quite a lot of no-code solutions. So there, there is basically two aspects to the platform. There is the engineering aspect and the API and the SDK where you can actually build stuff. And there is also no-code solutions, which basically allow you to either embed a checkout page inside your app or website or send payment links. So a lot of the SMBs are either using already platforms such as Wix, Shopify, WooCommerce, and stuff like that, where things are more plug and play. And some of them are just using simple solutions like sending somebody a payment link over WhatsApp or, or an email. Uh, but some of them also use engineers, mainly outsource engineers, you know, from a variety of companies to build stuff for them. And you also have enterprise clients, right? So what happens yeah. at that level? Enterprise clients is a different story. So we have around 5,000 clients that are defined in our perspective as enterprise. This is typically clients that are much bigger companies. They have their own engineering team and the product teams. And there we basically have a team of sales engineers that are developers that also are responsible for part of the sales cycle that are working very closely uh, with the client itself in order to customly build with him whatever he needs. Um, what, uh, how many enterprise clients do you have? Around 5,000. 5,000, yeah, sorry. I think something like right. this. Um, but I suppose another aspect is this, that uh, you sort of call yourself a kind of a Swiss army knife. You know, you've got lots of different aspects. Is that quite difficult 
from a technical point of view, is it quite difficult yeah. to keep all of those plates spinning in the air? Yeah, so you think about it, the fact that basically we took a world that was a one-trick pony world. Every company or every technology company provided only one piece of this entire platform, only collection, only disbursements, only effects, only KYC. And we plugged everything basically into our into one platform that does everything, which of course creates a lot of challenges uh, with it. Not only from the fact that you need to keep all these product pieces synchronized and up to date and are able to work with each other, but also from a scale perspective, the scale and the number of transactions that are going on on our platform on a daily basis is huge because we basically support all these different types of services and we operate in more than 100 countries across the globe. So it creates a lot of challenges from a technology perspective, how to keep the platform stable and able to actually process the payments and provide our clients the service that they expect with all the challenges that come in with it. Right. Um, you, you've got some... Uh, uh, there's a lot of regulation around all of this stuff. How aware does your team have to be around about the sort of regulatory aspects? So very, very plans? aware. We actually have a dedicated product and engineering team that is covering only the regulatory and, and compliance aspects of it. I think that the big difference in, in the fintech space between a good tech company and a mediocre tech company is how many people you actually need to be running manually your operation because of regulatory requirements. I think that what we've done successfully and a couple of other companies have done successfully in the world is basically automating and productizing from an engineering and product perspective the compliance requirements. And this reduces significantly the amount of humans you need in order to meet the regulatory requirements for specific types of tasks. It's not every engineer in the company needs to be a compliance or a regulatory specialist, but we actually have a team of around 40 people the only thing they do is basically the compliance and the uh, regulatory aspects of the business. And their job is to take the input from our compliance and legal teams and somehow automate it and productize it. So the machine will be able to execute on the vast majority of the tasks. Right, I see. And is regulation and, and those aspects getting harder? A lot of KYC, yeah. a lot of a lot of those issues to be to be aware it's, of it's getting harder and harder every year and in every single country you see more and more involvement of the regulators and and the requirements that they bring into the story make the life of you know companies very complex if they're not using the right product you know if you go 5 6 years back in time everybody did marketplace based structures basically buyer seller and a platform that sits in the middle and nobody cared what is going on in the middle now the regulator cares very much in what happens in the middle because they see these platforms as type of bank accounts. They provide a type of a bank account for the seller and the buyer pays into this account. So there are a lot of complexities that br it brings into the story. A lot of requirements to do the KYC, the KYB, the sanction screening, transaction monitoring, report on money laundering, stop money laundering. It's, never, it's a never ending story. And especially when you operate in more than one country, the requirements are not the same. And I think this is what people do not understand. How the hell do you handle all these different requirements into one product? Because it's not like we have 100 different platforms, a platform per country, and we're operating. It's one platform that serves more than 100 countries that somehow needs to adjust itself to all these different requirements. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges, you know, from a product and engineering perspective. You've got some competition. You've got uh, Fast, Checkout, Mambu, Rails Bank. How would you compare yourselves to those kinds of companies? So first of all, there are a lot of companies that are playing in the fintech space. I think that at the end of the day, if we really look at who we compete with on a day-to-day -day basis, it will be Stripe. We less stumble you know, into uh, some of the other companies, but we do see and stumble into Stripe quite a lot, especially in Europe and in Asia. Uh, you know, every company has its own, you know, secret sauce and, you know, the the thing that makes it different from the other. I think that the, one of the biggest things that makes us unique is the simplistic uh, API approach and the fact that we hide all the complexity behind the scenes. Like a lot of the other companies, they really tend to lean on the engineer that is writing code on the other side to be handling the requirements from a regulatory and money movement perspective. And they really just provide more some kind of a tech layer, but they don't resolve really the compliance and money movement challenges that exist behind the scenes. I think that we are the only ones that really take an approach of you write the code and we do the heavy lifting behind the scenes. 
exactly like Amazon, you don't really know where the server is and what the hell is going on with the server, but you know it is running. It's the same thing, side of the approach we take for money. And I think that's the biggest advantage, you know, that we have above the some of these companies that you mentioned. Yeah, because I know that Rap is, you've described yourselves as trying to be the sort of AWS for e-payments. Um, so that's the point, like using these your cl- cloud, cloud infrastructure to write yeah. the code uh, to interface with the payment infrastructure. Yeah, that, that, that's correct, because at the end of the day, we understand that there are there are a lot of different approaches to resolve this problem, but if you don't provide a resolution that is comprehensive, that basically the engineer that sits in front of the API only needs to think about his own code and he doesn't need really to understand that there is a bank account in Singapore that moves money to the UK and there is a requirement to report on this money movement in a specific way, then you didn't really solve his problem. If he really needs to deal with all the dirty stuff behind the scenes, then he's not able to scale his platform and he's going to stumble into endless number of challenges. And we took an approach that we see it as more an AWS approach where you don't need to know how it is working, but it is somehow in a miracle way works behind the scenes. Just focus on your product and you will be able to deliver on it. Uh, I mentioned uh, some of your potential competitors, but there's also a question from the audience come in about um, uh, Braintree, ADN, Stripe. Yeah. What, how would you compare yourselves to that? So three different uh, companies, all of them are great. I think if you look at Braintree and Edian and also Stripe in the majority of the markets that they operate in, they are a type of a one-trick pony. They're excellent in card acquiring, basically collecting payments from cards, especially Edian and Braintree. Uh, and they do card payments. They do collection of payments. Uh, and if you look at what Rapid offers, Rapid offers five products, collect, disperse, custodian wallet issuing an FX. And all these companies, except of Stripe that does a little bit more, they do only the collect piece. So as soon as you need to do more than just an e-commerce website with a checkout experience to collect money, then suddenly you need additional uh, providers or some kind of a platform like Rapid. And if a client, for example, needs to run a marketplace, he can't use really Braintree or Edian. He typically needs to go and find another company that will do the wallet, the disbursements, the KYC requirements. And if he comes to Rapid, and sometimes, by the way, in some markets also to Stripe, he has a whole-in-one platform approach that basically solves the challenges for him, and that's the that's the main difference. You've um you've got to point to a pretty big point, I think. What's your uh? How much money have you raised now at this point? We raised up until today seven hundred and eighty million dollars uh, from two thousand and sixteen up until two thousand and twenty-one, when was our last fundraise? What would you say your valuation is now? Depends who you ask, but it's probably somewhere in the range of it. The current market situation, around 10 billion, probably. About what? How? Around 10 billion, probably. 10 billion, yeah. roughly. Yeah. Not too bad. So you've got a bit of money to hire people at the moment. Yeah. 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 Money to hire. Um, <laughs> um, you were, actually, you acquired a company, Valet, Valitor, for 100 million. Yeah. Um, are you looking to acquire other companies? So we've done up until today in the history of the company, three acquisitions, 2020, we did one acquisition and then we did two acquisitions in 2022. And yes, we are very actively in the market in 2023, you know, trying to complete our fourth acquisition. You know, these market situations and conditions tend to create much bigger opportunities. You know, people say that you need a good uh, down, down market in order to basically find your next opportunity. And I think that, you know, we stumble into some great opportunities from an M&A perspective. And from, you know, our goal is to try and complete a deal before the end of 2023. And we're very active in the market of trying to doing it because we believe that it's great to go organically and we go organically more than 100% year over year. But if you really want to take it to the next stage, and from our perspective, taking it to the next stage is getting to $1 billion in revenue in a year and a half uh, time frame or two years time frame, then you need to do some acquisitions in order to fuel it up. So, that, I mean, there's clearly a rapid pace of development in the whole space and so many problems are being solved now. But given that um, the payment sector is so connected now, do you think there are many challenges left in the Fintech oh, space? Uh, there are endless challenges every single day, you know, in this industry. I wake up in the morning with challenges. Like I, I wish I will get to the office one day and the, the greeting that I will get from people is, you won't believe yesterday was the greatest day ever. You know, everything works seamlessly. You can go to the beach or go have a breakfast. It never happens. 
every single morning there is a problem, there is an escalation, there is a regulator, there is money stuck, something is broken. I think people misunderstand, you know, how complex it is. They think that, okay, Apple Pay, Google Pay came in, you have an app that you can transfer money, it's over. The, the complexity only, you know, becomes more and more, you know, challenging because, first of all, there are endless number of new payment methods that pop up. If you go to Asia, you can go, you go to Latin America, you have all these local wallets that come in. Every single country is creating their own payment scheme. India did it, Brazil did it, Singapore did it, Australia is doing it. It's not integrated to anything. The regulator comes in and requires more reporting, more uh, transaction monitoring. The fraudsters are becoming much more sophisticated. It never ends and it becomes more and more complex. So the spaghetti that we had to write in 2018 in order to try and connect a lot of these things is becoming much more challenging in 2023 and not streamlined. We've got a question here from the audience. Um, how is Rapid handling the simplistic API approach in parallel to supporting different alternative payment methods of different countries? Yeah, so I think that one of the biggest investments that we've done over the years is basically to streamline the API and to provide some kind of a simplistic approach from an API perspective that when you send out an API call or you use our new SDK, you don't need to think or know too much about if it is a card payment in Europe or if it is an Indonesian e-wallet or a cash payment in Mexico. You know, we streamlined it in a way that it is the easiest way that you can transact, I think, in the world today. And we're constantly working in order to make it better. We just implemented across the entire company an open API approach that is supposed to take us also to the next level from a reporting and a documentation perspective. And we heavily invest in our sandbox department. I encourage anybody you know, to go and try the sandbox environment and you can see that pretty much creating a payment in Mexico for cash or doing it with a debit or a credit card in Berlin, it looks the same. And it's mainly because we created this layer that is supposed to streamline it. Well, there you go. There's your answer. Um, can we cover, I mean, sometimes at these conferences, you know, talk about blockchain and its usefulness. What sort of, um, what opinions do you have about blockchain and crypto in payments and in, so, and in what you do? So first of all, I will give you my personal opinion and then I will explain, you know, what Rapid does in the space. The personal opinion that I have is that not a single country on planet Earth will agree to turn crypto into an official currency because central banks, regulators, and governments will never allow somebody else to print money. The way that governments rule, they rule based on the ability to control the money. And this is how you control people, by controlling their money and taxes and everything that's related to it. If you think that somebody issues a coin in Japan or in Venezuela or whatever you want, and this coin suddenly will become the official money of Germany, you don't understand how the world works. It's never going to happen. The regulators are never going to let it happen. And this is why I don't believe that crypto as it is today can turn into a currency that is official. Yes, it is a commodity. Yes, it is like gold. People trade it, believe in it, invest in it. That I get and I agree. I also think that every single central bank at the end of the day will have to issue its own digital coin. So I believe that it is clear, I think, for everybody that the European Union Central Bank will issue a digital euro, which will be based on blockchain. The Fed in the US will issue a digital dollar. And yes, these will become currencies. So the technology will be used and the concept will be used, but in a different way than what it is used today. Rapid today does not process crypto payments. We are now uh, uh, doing crypto payouts. So we collect basically funds on behalf of our clients in fiat currencies euro, dollar, whatever you want, and you can get the money out instead to your bank account. You can get it to your crypto wallet in some currencies, but that, that's at the current stage, the approach that we take, that the payment itself and the currency that you pay with is always a fiat, fiat currency. Right, okay. So um, it's still we've still got a long way to go then. Yeah, especially from a regulatory perspective and a maturity perspective. Like People understand that money is serious, and I, I understand the the need for decentralized approach for a lot of different things. But I also understand that the reason why there are governments, central banks and regulators is exactly to avoid the situation. There is chaotic uh, money that is flying around and is creating lack of stability, you know, in the financial system. So I also don't think, you know, that anybody will allow it to happen in the short term, but they will issue at the end their own digital currencies. And yeah, you will have it, but it's not going to be Dogecoin for sure. 
Well, it's, I've got one more question for you, um, but just quickly, I just want to say, everybody, thank you very much for your questions. I um, uh, just want to do a quick shout out for Tom Hayton in the front here. Put your hand up, Tom, who's uh, here to talk to startups about your stories. But um, my last question to you is um, the future. So where do you see yourselves in sort of two, three, four, five years time? So the goal for Rapid, and this is what we keep telling every single employee in the company, is that we fast forward five years down the road. There is a conversation that is happening here in the hallway, in a garage or in an office between people that are building a company, a product or a feature. And they're talking about the fact that they need to implement some kind of a financial related service inside it. They don't need to think how they do it. For them, the automatic re answer will be, we're going to do it with Rapid, exactly like today when they know that they need to learn something. So they're going to AWS, to Google Compute Cloud or Azure. They don't even think about, let's go to the store and buy a server and an operation system. Nobody thinks this way anymore. We want to change the way people think and how they use these type of things. Five years down the road, basically the answer for any type of a financial services related approach will be, sure, let's go to Rapid. There is a platform. They will do it for us. Well, it's going to be a very interesting uh, thing to, uh, to watch in the future. But for now, from me, Mike Butcher from TechCrunch, from Eric Stillman from Rapid, thanks very much. And enjoy We Are Developers. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.